Okay, um, kia ora koutou everyone. Um, okay, so today I've um, seen a little bit already from mainly museums about um, the inclusion of a 3D element within um, this kind of cultural heritage sector. Um, it doesn't necessarily seem like an obvious uh, thing that you would find inside of a library. Um, and I guess within the National Library, other libraries, um, city libraries, we don't hold a huge deal of 3D objects. Um, and so there's also a larger question of whether there would be any reason to even go down that path of looking at um, 3D technologies and bringing that into our space at all. Um, but as I um, kind of continue along this, I think I'm going to try and make a case that um, there is definitely a reason to do it, if not for any other reason that um, it's such an emerging part of the world that we're living in at the moment. Um, this, this technology is becoming more widely um, used with um, other kind of industries around us. And as we do use it more and more, um, we are recording information in new ways. We're recording um, rather than in sort of traditional uh, means of, you know, uh, text or um, even video in some cases. Um, this, this is going to be something that for our own kind of collecting purposes, we're going to need to um, put a little bit more of a focus on. Um, so if I'm just sort of show you a little bit about 3D printing in libraries. So um, this tends to be the main focus area that a lot of generally public libraries look into when it comes to this technology. Um, there's always a little bit of a debate that's going on around having 3D printers in libraries. Generally, it's seen more as a novelty, I suppose. Um, the quote that I have here is actually from an Australian librarian who kind of sparked a lot of debate on this topic. Um, his name was Hugh Rundle. Uh, it says here, if 3D printing was a truly useful technology for libraries, there'd be serious articles about the potential um, for how we can use that to store information, make it discoverable, etc. cetera. Um, so this has been our first kind of venture as a library into 3D technologies, and that is um, with 3D printing. Um, however, yeah, it often gets kind of given this perspective that it's just something that can be used for novelty for, in this case, printing in chocolate. Um, but I think what it offers, at least from my point of view, is um, just an immediate way of being able to get your hands on with this new sort of technology, with this new way of dealing with information as more things start moving down this path. Um, it's, it's just an entry point and it provides access to a wider community of people who may not necessarily um, be able to afford to look into these kind of things. And so off the back of getting 3D printers ourselves in our own spaces um, at the National Library, we started working in partnership with Victoria University's School of Architecture and Design. Um, every year we run uh, summer scholarship projects with the university and um, through these summer scholarship projects we're actually able to explore the ways that this technology can be made useful inside of a library um, and why that may even be um, you know a necessary thing in the future. Um, if we look back kind of over the history of libraries and the kind of materials that we hold or even just the ways that we create knowledge um, I guess the earliest sort of times we would have been recording a lot of um, our stories and our experiences and our understanding of the world through an oral tradition. Um, so in that instance, we don't actually have any kind of an artifact in which information is stored. Um, often it, it comes down to mnemonic techniques and being able to remember how things work or what things are and what maybe could be poisonous in the world. And within that, um, within that way of trying to maintain some kind of repository, the repository is held within people. Um, in those instances, there are methods that people use to be able to try and remember things that would otherwise um, you know, be 
for maybe you or I, um, easy to forget. So one of those sort of methods was, um, for instance, you could take a geographic location and you can try and use your path down that, um, down a street or down um, sort of like a forest path or something and just peg each object as you're walking as a means of being able to um, associate so a word with this tree, a word with that one, it just, it's a way of being able to kind of take a, a mental note but out on the physical kind of a landscape. Um, as time went on, people started using clay tablets. Clay might be a little bit heavy or, you know, you don't want to carry that around with you. So later on, industries start moving to paper. You've got the printing press. You start moving into books. And once there are more static ways of recording information, things that you can actually pass on to someone else so that they can see this is true. We can look through this, you know, the, is this verifiable? Did this come from this place? Or um, are the origins as you say they are? Then we actually have an increasing amount of fidelity in the way that we store and record information. Um, I guess as we learn more about how we copy and keep um, material over longer periods of time, we learn other ways that they can, that they can be at risk. For instance, with microfilm, um, there's plenty of examples that you are probably all aware of where an original item might be recorded on microfilm and then um, that original was then thrown away only to later on discover that that microfilm is not a good enough copy to be able to refer back to. Um, with digital materials, there's more fidelity there. You're able to capture you know, at a higher resolution, um, more details, more, um, more kind of accurate representation of what that thing really was. But at the end of the day, we're still stuck on a two-dimensional screen. We're still stuck generally with photographs to um, a single point of perspective of what this, what this information can hold. So, um, for instance, you may, have, you may be able to take something like the Treaty of Waitangi, which is the first sheet at least is on like parchment which looks like it's probably actually taken from a, some goat skin. There's sort of a whole story just in the texture and the, the way that that moves that you can't really capture just through, um, just through a photograph and I guess that main, those things may not be the, the main point of why you want to collect those things but as time does move by um, we are finding you know if you want to be able to return to the point of origin where something came from, some of this extra detail is actually becoming increasingly more necessary as our default means of being able to collect things or to be able to record and copy things um, has a huge, well, much larger demand on being able to maintain that level of fidelity with your information. Um, so what I have here is just an example of the technologies that may not necessarily be dominant at the moment, but within industry in general, are uh, becoming more and more common, and which is sort of shaping the way in which we, I guess we would produce products in the first instance, but also the ways that um, new knowledge is being created. So I guess there are always going to be things like books, which is like kind of the staple of libraries, which they're never going to necessarily become obsolete, but as we start performing in other ways, as we start doing things as a society in other ways, um, in order to be able to retain a record of our cultural heritage, we do want to be able to try and find way ways that we can um, store these other things which may not be suitable in the kinds of formats that we have available at the moment. So everyone at the moment tends to have some kind of a mobile device, so that, that's quite a, you know, that's been taken up already. Everyone, everyone has some form of uh, generally contact with each other through um, a mobile means you don't have to post a letter etc. Um, as we kind of come around the circle we start seeing things like location detection technologies so being able to make your whereabouts discoverable um, to be able to place a point on a map. Um, these things are kind of taken for granted a little bit now but um, there's always new information that's being collected from this and the ways that that information can be used um, to create a sort of a broader picture or a deeper sort of understanding of the things that we're collecting today. Um, so just to make 
kind of more clear what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, while there is a general focus, I guess, on exploring the kinds of collections that we already have available, um, there is also a, a need which may not necessarily be fully explored around yeah, how we, we capture these um, emerging um, forms of information, which seem to be quite fluid and, I guess, in some ways not too tangible just because um, they're subject to, to change and with things being made available online, that information can, that can be edited and updated and um, it doesn't necessarily remain in some f static form that, that we may be used to. Um, as we come back around to 3D printing, um, it completely changes the supply chain. So while once upon a time you may have probably bought your music in a store, you're probably downloading it now. Um, in time to come, that is a likely scenario for um, the way that you may be getting products or being able to purchase um, items um, rather than actually having them delivered. And in so doing, you're also making much less of a demand on transport logistics, etc. cetera. So um, through that, yeah, it, it's cutting down costs that we're otherwise including into other things that we do in the broader picture of our lives. But what that, that means for libraries as well is we would then have a reason, at least, to look into being able to collect the sorts of designs or 3D models um, that may have some kind of a cultural or, I guess, historic for the future impact um, and to be able to retain those maybe in a repository or something so that they can be made available later. Um, one thing that is, I guess, look, being looked into uh, quite a lot more often at the moment is big data. Um, and augmented reality, I guess, is kind of here already, but I guess if anyone's sort of had a look at it, it, it again, we're still, for the most part, um, trapped behind a two-dimensional display. Uh, so following on from um, augmented reality, um, we have light field technologies, um, which are sometimes referred to as mixed reality. So this is just a, you may have seen this before somewhere else, but it's um, an example of, I'll just make that a little larger. So this is, a, uh, I'll, I'll just let you watch it through it and then I'll give a brief explanation about it. So um, in this video, what we're seeing is um, mixed reality, and what that involves is, as opposed to being able to view extra digital information overlaid onto the world through an iPad, which is kind of how we're doing things with augmented reality at the moment, um, what we have is light field signals being projected directly into one's eyes. And so what it's doing is it's creating a blend of digital um, sort of overlays with the physical world in a way which is quite indistinguishable from, um, you know, it, it looks like it's out there, essentially. Um, and the sort of projections from the Magic Leap who have created this is that um, the uptake of that technology around about the 2020s should be probably about 70% of people will be looking at having that kind of um, technology available to them. And so with that just around the corner, um, that's going to sort of impact on the way that the material that we collect now um, is made available. I guess we're, we're looking at things still in very two-dimensional um, ways. And I, that, that would still be a way, I guess, 
in which you can view that, but whether that provides you with the most or the highest level of detail that you need to be able to um, conduct research um, is just another question. Um, in one of our earlier exhibitions that we run at the National Library, um, Big Data, uh, we looked into the use of LiDAR and um, remote sensing technology to capture um, sort of landforms. And we're looking at it again with our current Unfolding the Map exhibition. Um, but what this shows is the way that um, sort of point clouds can be generated to create 3D models of an environment. So um, while the sorts of things that we may collect at the moment will be uh, you know, maps or um, photographs of locations, being able to in actually capture entire um, three-dimensional models. Um, that just provides another sort of an edge on um, what later on we will be able to sort of interact with. Um, and then what can be done with that in terms of output, whether that be 3D printed into a model that can be used for other purposes or whether that, that model can reveal something about the time that wasn't, wasn't previously available um, with other means of capturing information. Um, so in, in terms of um, open data, there's a lot of information that is now made available just publicly throughout the internet and the way that that information can be used by individuals is quite limited in terms of um, their understanding around what they can do with it. So a huge part of what our role is at, um, in the public programs team is to be able to facilitate the, an understanding around digital technologies and develop digital literacies. Um, one form of information uh, um, with these data sets is geospatial information. So what we've got here in this image is um, uh, it's a map of sorts of Wellington, and it's all just survey data. Um, the way this works is it's not really a map designed for people. It's a map more designed for machines. So the pixels in this raster image, they represent different levels of elevation. Um, as that can be examined, you can then generate sort of virtual terrains from that, which, which reflect um, to the human eye a little bit more accurately what that information should look like. Um, other sorts of data sets that are available out there. Um, for instance, you have information from the city council here, which shows the entire sort of footprint of the Wellington CBD. Um, within that, you've got information saying how high each building is. If you were to take some of this information and combine it together, um, you can get outputs which will provide a model of the um, city there, of the landscape with the, the buildings available on the top. So this is all just information in spreadsheets or on tables. Um, and then from that, you are able to um, sort of visualize in such a way that you're able to interact with it uh, without having to know things like you know structured query language or other scripting languages. You're able to just um, move in there and just sort of make that visually. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it's a little bit, little bit buggy. But um, yeah, so the, um, but yeah, while that, while that is something that's available today, um, we have this kind of technology and that sort of data readily available. Um, where I'm trying to go with this is um, this is a new way of recording information. It's a new way of recording. Um, there are new ways of being able to put this stuff together. But when we want to reach back and take older information, um, that's not as easy to do. So with the summer scholarship projects that we um, have focused on, they've gone back into our collections and they've taken uh, material which may not necessarily be um, easy to work with and have been able to bring that up to date and be able to pull extra information out of that that wasn't already there. So in this instance here we have a model that they have built of the Wellington waterfront with three different puzzle pieces. Those puzzle pieces can be overlaid on top of the model of Wellington and then through an iPad um, it's possible to then view the footprint of 
the city at that point. So as each puzzle piece is added onto that model, um, that footprint is then updated for the time. Uh, with that, that's not only the new buildings that have been built since, but it's an update to the entire city. So other buildings that may have been replaced or have grown up around it, those will also um, be added in as well. And this will be um, available to view um, once the library reopens um, as part of our Unfolding the Map program. Um, other ways that the that Victoria University has been able to sort of reconfigure the information in our collections has been through taking floor plans. So in this instance, we have Lambton Tower, um, which was a tower that was never actually built. And they've been able to use, um, I just guess, CAD, but from this, they've also learned to um, develop the algorithm that was used over aerial photographs, or aerial images to um, develop the, the buildings on the, on the previous slide as well. Um, and here we just have a, a 3D printed um, interpretation of that, which is taken from, from our collection materials. Um, again, we've got an image here of um, the Wellington Waterfront, which is a virtual reality um, experience that had been created using um, collection material, as well as the basis for being able to see what the waterfront looked at at that particular time. Um, and the idea behind this then is that you can actually take some of this material out into the world. If you were to look at it through, for instance, um, a pair of binoculars with a virtual reality headset in it, then that allows you to be able to move back and forth between the physical and um, the digital interpretation of what um, Wellington may have looked like at that point. Um, just looking at some precedents for other means of being able to take older um, or limited um, materials and uh, what do we got here? All right. And do things with them. So here we have um, Rec Ray, which is also known as Project Mosul. Um, in Iraq, the Mosul Museum was destroyed by ISIS. Um, Project Mosul originally was put in place to crowdsource photographs from um, just visitors who had been to the Mosul Museum and then to use photogrammetry as a means of being able to um, just restore lost the, uh, the model there. I've got two minutes left, I think. Um, so I'll just try and move through quite quickly. Um, so what 3D printing in libraries provides is a means of being able to take some of these objects that have been um, reconfigured out of collection material and to make them physical. Um, with working on um, other projects with the university through the Summer Scholarship Program. We've explored um, augmented reality, so we've been able to incorporate that into existing exhibitions that we have on display. Um, so these, this is, um, these are some examples just from last year's um, program that we ran. So we have World War I, a contemporary conversation, which we used augmented reality to enhance that. Um, we had um, a child's war, which was one of the exhibitions that we held in the Alexander Turnbull um, gallery as well, which um, was able to then use augmented reality and 3D printing to um, look at, uh, for instance, sheet music and things like that, and to be able to play back um, music from sheet music using um, augmented reality as a, as a means of being able to identify whereabouts in that sheet music the music should be playing from. And then we had um, an interpretation of Paul Gendon's material as well, so taking sketches of puppets um, from those collection materials and then being able to bring those to life uh, using motion capture to be able to, to move and freeze those models at a particular point where they can then be pushed out for 3D printed, um, you know, birthed into the world from, from that point. Um, kind of just rushed ahead because really coming to the end of the, of the session here now. Um, but what this all sort of leads down to is the idea of um, what has been coined semantic nodes. So um, the use of augmented reality and 3D printed technologies um, just allows a way of being able to interact with the world, which 
previously wasn't possible, so it's just being able to blur the lines between physical and digital. And within a library setting, what that means is, um, for instance, being able to take an original item and be able to get descriptive information out of it just through things like image recognition, um, and then maybe using real items to be able to hyperlink to, to other items um, just through looking at those through one medium or another. Um, and then there's obviously, um, in our role as learning facilitators, as educators, um, a much broader um, range of what is actually possible by using um, these technologies as, as an educational tool as well. Um, really, I've got one minute left, I can see, which is probably questions and answers, but I'm probably not gonna get very far with that. But so um, thank you guys, um, really had too much to get through. Um, but I'll be around tomorrow as well if you guys have any further questions. Uh, cheers. Thank you.